I want to welcome everybody. I'm just so delighted that you've tuned in for Hawthorne University's All About Alumni. And since we are delighted to have a number of new people on the call with us today, I want to let you know that if you are listening for the first time, that All About Alumni is our platform to showcase Hawthorne graduates to be able to share their post-grad activities and their accomplishments. You know, the many ways that they're using their Hawthorne education and their practices is really nothing short of amazing. We have a variety of nationally accredited degree and certificate programs in Hawthorne, and some of them are for people that are pursuing a cl clinical track with the goal of working directly with clients, but our other programs are dedicated to people that are seeking to primarily educate, whether that's writing books or develop courses, workshops and programs, public speaking, things like that. And uh, as well, well, we have other programs for people who simply want to learn valuable, credible information in a conducive environment. The success of our students is really the testament of Hawthorne University's mission and principles to provide quality, affordable, holistic health and nutrition education. Regardless, we all love to learn more at Hawthorne, and that's why we're back here today. I'm your host, Paula Bartholomew. I'm one of the founders of Hawthorne. It's such an honor and privilege to be able to speak with and feature our graduates, so let me get started with today. We're going to feature our alum, Megan Lyons, today, who's going to reveal how failure, continuous learning, and self-care have shaped her as an entrepreneur and allowed her to serve thousands. Megan's going to address her background and how she became drawn to holistic health and nutrition, both personally and professionally. She's also going to speak to her educational journey and detail her experience in Hawthorne's Master Holistic Nutrition Program. Then she'll dive deep into the amazing accomplishments and opportunities she's experienced post-graduation. Megan will certainly share her insightful philosophy of success as well as failure as she openly discusses hers, the value of and her commitment to continuous learning and the necessity of taking care of ourselves as healthcare practitioners. While I have the delight and pleasure of speaking with Megan. You also have the opportunity to ask her questions directly too. So I don't want you to hold back any comment or question that you have. Please just write it into the question panel. And uh, we're recording this. We will we'll post it to our website in just a few days. You'll find it under archived webinars. And we'll save um, questions until the end. All right, all that said, it's time to welcome you, Megan. I'm just so excited to be here together. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm thrilled to be here as well. It'll be great to share, uh, hopefully, a, a bunch of value with everyone on the call and, and share what Hawthorne has meant to me. Thank you so much. I want to um, let everybody know a little bit about you before we start. Sure. So Megan has shared her game-changing approach to wellness with thousands of people through personalized health coaching, corporate and group wellness programs, and motivational and educational speaking. As founder and owner of the Lion's Share Wellness, she's deeply passionate about inspiring others to feel their healthiest and happiness, happiest. Megan's the author of Start Here, Seven Easy Diet-Free Steps to Achieve Your Ultimate Health and Happiness. It's a top 10 Amazon bestseller in nutrition, and her Lion's Share Coaching Academy and Business Coaching help aspiring coaches and nutritionists streamline their businesses and skyrocket their success. In addition to Hawthorne, Megan holds degrees and certifications from Harvard University, Northwestern University, and the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. She's also board certified by the National Association of Nutrition Professionals as a holistic nutritionist. She lectures widely at hospitals, corporations, and organizations. And when she's not health coaching, you can find her working out, teaching fitness classes, cooking, reading, traveling, and cheering on those Dallas Mavericks. She's currently living in Dallas, that explains the Mavericks, mm -hmm. with her husband Kevin and the adorable dogs, Maverick and Riley. And I have a sneaking suspicion that Maverick is the Dallas Mavericks. That's right. You, know, <laughs> you got that. So Megan, delighted to have you with us. Are you ready to start sharing this journey of yours? I am ready. Thank you so much for going through that, Paula. I appreciate it. You've covered my background fairly well, uh, excellently well, better than I was going to, so I appreciate that. Uh, what I'll cover in addition today is why I chose Hawthorne, uh, my journey with failure and uh, how I don't really consider a failure a failure, continuous learning, taking care of ourselves, uh, desire to serve, and the necessity of self-belief. So 
You covered a lot about me. Uh, I'll just add a bit. The Lion's Share Wellness uh, uh, started, began in 2014, opened, that's what I was going for, after my history of management consulting. So I came from the business world, which is a little non-traditional in these parts. Um, I, I thought I would be in management consulting or some form of business forever. And I thought nutrition was really just a passion, something that I read books about, something that I went to conferences about on the side and uh, fiddled around with in my own life. I didn't think about it as a career until 2014 uh, or until a few years before 2014. Uh, but 2014 is when I actually acted on it. I've been full time since then in the business and I love it. I love every bit of it. I'm so grateful for it. Um, you mentioned some of the things that I like to do outside of working. Traveling, unfortunately, right now at the moment is not happening very much with the, the outbreak, but in general, um, that's a big part of my life. And, and my family, I also live about five miles away from my parents and my sister and her fiance and his daughter. So uh, family is a big part of my life as well. Should be. Well, um, you've got a variety of degrees in different topics. So um, is that right? Different topics? Yes, that's right. So I started uh, after high school, of course, at, at Harvard in 2007, and they didn't have a business degree. So I chose economics, which was the closest thing, uh, and really just learned a lot there about how to learn. But I think even though I don't use economics today, I still use a lot of those skills in terms of reading studies and things like that. Uh, I did go to management consulting, like I said, and then somewhere in there, I got an MBA at Northwestern. And during that time, it was when I started exploring my passions. I thought I didn't really have one, and I actually went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, um, which is a one-year health coaching program during that time. And I'm really grateful that I did because it helped me realize that uh, there is a whole world of necessity out there and that people really need the knowledge of nutrition and positivity and wellness. And so I'm grateful for that. And uh, once I did that, I started my business in 2014, like I mentioned, I was, I was making a difference, I was having fun, but I really realized that I needed more education than what IAN was able to offer me. Uh, I needed to go deeper. I needed to understand a lot more of the science so that I could help my clients in the best way. Uh, and so I started looking for a master's program that I could pursue while running my business full time. And of course, that's where Hawthorne came in. Thank you, Megan. Um, you know, we have a number of people that have completed the INN program and then come on um, to, to get further education at Hawthorne for the same reasons. They just don't feel like they're qualified to work at a deep clinical level like you have been. Mm -hmm. So thank you for, for sharing that. So choosing Hawthorne, um, it's really so obvious that you value education. Can you tell us a little bit about how and why you chose Hawthorne? Sure. Um, like we already said, the depth of the nutrition education was critical for me. I love education and um, I love the certifications as well, but I really wanted to learn and wanted to go deep into topics that interest me. So um, I, after looking through several syllabi and things like that, I really liked the readings and the material that was available to me at Hawthorne. Um, the one-to-one -one support and interaction with professors I thought was so uh, amazing and, and very welcome. It was so great to be able to work with experts in whatever field it was that the class was in uh, and get that one-to-one -one attention. The scheduling was really important for me. Like I mentioned, I was already running my business full-time. Um, and and full-time for me, as we'll discuss later, means like, major, major full-time. I'm always trying to cut back on that, uh, but I needed to be able to accommodate my busy schedule, and I also really liked being able to go faster when maybe it was a slower time in life, go through courses pretty quickly, or spread out courses if I needed a little extra time, so that scheduling was important, uh, and then the potential for board certification uh, like I mentioned, I'm really in it for the knowledge, but as long as I was going to go through it, I think that 
addition of board certification uh, was really meaningful to me. So I wanted the program to be um, a, a program that was open for board, board certification. And it does. And, you know, thank you for framing about the um, the one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship that you have with faculty as you're going yeah. through that. And, you know, this program, uh, the Master of Science in Holistic Nutrition program isn't just a master's program. It's a com combination of that and a clinical training program, hence the 60 credits, right? So you jumped in and into a, to a big load there, but intentionally. And um, thank you for sharing what your experience was. And, and I, I think so highly of our faculty and yeah. and the, their expertise and their day-to-day. -day. I mean, they're all practicing clinicians. And so, like you said, they're able to bring that experience and really guide you through your upper level clinical courses. So let's come back to the Lion's Share Wellness. And now that you own this, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that business and who you're serving, who's your client base. Sure, I don't actually have one particular demographic. Uh, which I know based on my business background is, is recommended depending on who you ask. But I choose clients and, and they choose me really strategically. There's one kind of uniting factor, which is that they have given up hope on themselves or on their health in a lot of situations, which sounds demotivating, but it's actually a really nice place for me to be able to bring them back the hope. Uh, both in themselves, in their health, and their ability to feel good again. So it, it's really quite an uplifting place for me. I serve a lot of corporate executives, C-level type people who uh, don't necessarily have time, in quotes, because I think everyone needs to make time, but they feel like they don't have time for their life and health or lifestyle and health demands. Um, I can relate to their background given my previous business experience. I also work with a lot of busy moms, busy parents in general, because again, they find it impossible or, or too difficult to prioritize their own health when they're so busy with their kids. I work with those who are struggling with emotional eating. They're kind of stuck in this pattern that they feel like they can never get out of, and they believe it isn't possible to break the emotional eating habit. And then I work with people that I lovingly call doctor threats, where their doctor has threatened to put them on medication for high cholesterol or diabetes or high blood pressure, you name it, and they kind of feel like in the pit of their stomach, that's not the right answer. Uh, they believe that, they, that there is a solution out there that's not medication. They don't want the medication, but they just don't know how to do it. Um, and so I love to help work with them on their diet and lifestyle. And then they, of course, work with their doctor. I, I don't suggest they come off any medications or anything like that. Um, so you'll see the common thread with all of these is that people barely have hope. They're, they feel like they're in a pickle. And one of my strengths is really restoring belief in them and, and hope for their healthy and happy future. What a beautiful way to frame that, you know, a strength is restoring their beliefs in themselves, right? And that that's your starting point yeah. and it continues on to their own success in that journey. Really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you do a number of other things besides one-to-one um, -one nutrition consultants. So um, why don't you share with the audience what, what other things you're up to? Sure. So I do a lot. I like to keep myself busy and I like to always be experimenting with fun new things to be able to offer. I do group programs. Right now I am enrolling for another 10-day reset, which is a program I've run nine times. It's my most popular program and it's just what it sounds. It's 10 days focused on reducing inflammatory foods and prioritizing self-care and whole foods and just really giving ourselves the gift of focusing on ourselves for 10 days. I also run a group program called the 8% Team, which I named because 92% of people do not reach their health goals, which I found really sad. So I wanted us to be the 8% that do reach their health goals. And this was a three-month program uh, at the end of the year to focus on goal setting and um, weekly accountability and sustainable health habits. So I like doing some group programs. I like speaking a lot. That was a focus for 2020, it's taking a slight hiccup now uh, with social distancing, but I speak to a lot of corporations, hospitals, conferences, et cetera. Uh, I do business coaching, which I've really only added in the past couple of years because 
I've been so fortunate to have success in my own business. And I really see business coaching as a way to expand the ripple of uh, impact I'm being able to make. If I coach another aspiring business owner, then they can go help hundreds of people with their health. So it, the ripple impact is even bigger. I do some food intolerance testing, some running coaching. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, of everything related to this field, everything I can offer. I'm a certified running coach as well. Um, I do webinars. I had a year of free webinars on different topics, and now they're just a few dollars on my website. A big part of what uh, we'll go into later is my morning routine. And so I created a pepper planner, a planner to help people prioritize their morning routine. And then I do a lot of social media and free offerings so that I can help people who might or might not be interested in hiring me one to one. I love sharing little tidbits on Instagram um, and positivity and health bits and things like that. And then I do lots of free opt-ins like a, a customizable grocery list or energy boosting tips or self-care ideas. It obviously helps me build my email list, but I really just like reaching more people and impacting as many people as I can. And gosh, it's so important. You just think of the time that we're in right now and there's yeah. such a fabulous service that you're reaching out to so many. Um, well, you mentioned public speaking and how much you enjoy that, and I enjoy listening to you in any time that I can. But what are what are some of the places that you that you've shared your work with? Sure. Yes, I um, primarily speak to large corporations, a lot of consulting firms, since that's my background. But law firms, investment firms, um, any type of business. I also speak at almost all the major Dallas hospitals, um, at various conferences they host or speaking to their employees, things like that. And then I love speaking at large conferences as well. Terrific, well, you know, this all sounds smooth and really good, but um, has it all been smooth sailing? Has it all been this oh, seamless okay. as it sounds like, Megan? <laughs> no, this is a highlight reel, um, but I'm happy to share what's behind the curtain. Uh, it's definitely not all smooth sailing. In fact, I actually love failure because I think if we're not failing, we're not pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones. And, and I really do believe that outside of our comfort zone, that's where the greatness is created. I was not always like this. As a kid, I grew up as a really high achiever. I used to hate anything that could be perceived as a failure. It used to paralyze me completely uh, because I really thought it was a reflection on me. My value as a person wasn't as good if I had a failure in something that I was trying to do. But now I just realize it's information and I can learn from every single failure. Actually, just listened to a great podcast where um, the host was Amy Porterfield and I believe the guest was Jennifer all would um, and she was saying that we don't the confidence can't be the goal we can't just get confidence it's not something we can just pick up but the way we develop that is by having courage and that gives us confidence and how we develop courage is just to do hard things knowing that we're gonna fail putting ourselves out there as much as possible and knowing that some of these are gonna be failures but taking the courageous step anyway that's what develops confidence, and I love that. One example is when I started my business, I reached out to 50 gyms in the first couple of weeks, and I offered them a free health seminar. And I thought for sure that 49 of those would say yes, because it was free, and I really believed in my value, and, and um, unfortunately, 49 of them reached out, and they said no, or they didn't respond, and only one said yes. And this one that I gave a couple people, maybe five or six people were sitting on the floor of the gym and it was super awkward and I didn't do a great job. It was low quality and I could have really easily focused on the fact that 49 gyms said no and that my presentation to the one wasn't very good. But instead, I realized that that was a win. This was my first presentation. I got to reach a few people that day. I had the, uh, the opportunity to impact their lives. And I considered that as a success. I reframed it. And now I really think of failures like that as 
uh, important knowledge, but I know that I need to go quickly. I can't let myself linger on the failure. I just have to learn something and bounce right off to the next thing. If something fails, it's no big deal. I'll just call it a loss. Well, if it's something I put a ton of effort into, maybe I'll keep pushing it through. I, I don't forget that quickly if it's something I've put a ton of effort into, but otherwise I just learn something and move on. And whatever I learn often shapes the next effort. It makes me much better at whatever I'm trying to do next. Um, the last thing here is realizing that we all fail. It's okay, it's not a reflection of you. Just look, continue pushing forward. Don't let it spiral you downwards. Don't ruminate over it. Don't think about that it's a reflection on you or you should have done something different. It's just a little bump in the road. Just keep pushing forward. Gosh, Megan, two words that really stand out in that. And, you know, thank you for being so vulnerable and authentic and, and sharing that too. But it took courage to do that. And courage was the key word here. Yeah. You know, as you, uh, uh, you know, to, courage to, to have ideas, courage to put them out there, courage to fail, and courage to reframe failure as our small to big successes in some way. At least you tried and you reached your, at least you reached those five people in the beginning and That's had nice. the motivation to keep going. That's so nice. <laughs> those are, those are understandable. They're normal failures. Most of us face them at some point. But sometimes, do you find that they can be unmotivating? How do you stay motivated um, despite these kind of obstacles? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they can if you let them. Anything can be unmotivating if you let it be unmotivating or demotivating, if you just sit there and, and think about it as a failure. But what I do when I'm kind of feeling a little in the dumps or I'm letting something get to me, I first remind myself of why I'm doing it. I, remind myself why I'm in this business, why I own this business, why I am shaping my life around helping people become their best self. Sometimes I'll even pull out a little folder that I have on my computer of testimonials and I'll look at all the people I've helped over the years. And honestly, this gives me a little ego boost, um, but it, it's really about them. It just makes me feel good that I am making a difference. That makes it much easier to press forward despite the little failures. I also really like perspective. At the end of the day, I'm waking up every day. I'm healthy. I'm happy. I'm doing what I love. I'm working for myself, which is amazing. I have a happy and healthy family. My life is really good. And so if a program that I I'm trying to run doesn't get enough people or a post doesn't get enough likes or something like that. It's really about perspective setting that these are small things in the grand scheme of things and I can still be grateful for so much. I, I learn from a little failure um, and I still have my health and what's really important. So a little perspective setting. Uh, another thing that really helps me stay motivated is goal setting. I am huge on goal setting. I'm an achiever and so this comes more naturally to me, but I help clients through it even if this isn't natural for them because I really believe it. For me, I set yearly, monthly, uh, or quarterly, yearly, quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily goals. That's a lot of different goals and they're all subsets of each other. Um, but this really helps me stay focused and motivated. When I set a daily goal, I only set one number one daily goal every day, and that helps me align my priorities. Okay, is this helping me get to my number one goal? If not, maybe I'm just procrastinating, or maybe I could do something differently. Um, and then even those bigger goals, monthly, yearly goals, et cetera, that really just helps focus my effort. We're all working hard at something, but at least if we're focused, that can help us uh, achieve more success and, and stay motivated. And then lastly, continuous learning and continuous growth. It's easy, in my opinion, to kind of get complacent if we're not learning more. I think continuing to learn helps me stay motivated and just surrounding myself by people who have achieved more than I have, um, who are smarter than I am, things like that definitely keeps me motivated. Lifelong learning, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, coming back to the goal setting piece and regular check-ins with yourself, 
Yeah. Appreciate that. I think it's it's a message that's so helpful for everybody right now. You know, when we're in a in a state of chaos, really. So that's um, right. give it the goals. If you have goal, if you don't have any goals, then it's easy to throw your hands up in the air and say, ah, life is chaos. But if you have goals and you just have to pivot them, it can be really grounding and reassuring. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, you meant just co continuous learning. I said lifelong learning. Um, tell us a little bit what you mean, what that means to you. Yes, I am always learning. I love learning. If I could just be paid to get every degree at Hawthorne and in every school, I would do that for the rest of my life. So I love it so much. Um, but in the absence of that, I am learning every day. Reading is a huge one for me. I read every day. Um, I'm on a rotation. So at night before bed, I read novels just to put me to sleep. Um, but in the morning, I read a rotation between nutrition, business, and personal development. I have a, a huge stack of books to read, and I just go through them. Um, I always listen to podcasts, so anytime I'm driving or walking, sometimes when I'm walking, I like to just have silence. Uh, but if I am looking to listen to something, it's almost always a podcast, so I can stay learning. I love going to conferences, business, nutrition, personal development, you name it. And just being around friends and colleagues and networking groups, things like that, where I can look at people maybe in the same industry or maybe even in different industries and learn from their knowledge and what they're doing in business and in life. So basically, I'm just always continuing to learn as much as I can um, so that I can pass the best ideas along to my clients. Gosh, I'd love to know the podcasts that are really on your on your top list. Oh, I can <laughs> do on a regular my list. Okay. All so right, all right, and I'll and I'll share them with Hawthorne too. Thank you for that. Sure. So, it's thrilling to hear everything that you're doing and how you're doing. It sounds so exciting, but somewhat exhausting at the same time. <laughs> um, sounds like you might burn the candle at both ends. Is that true about you? Do you ever experience burnout around this? The short answer is yes. If I <laughs> I remember one time in an acupuncture session, I was feeling frustrated by the fact that I had not been able to alleviate some stress I was carrying. And my acupuncture said something genius to me, which is this is your lifelong battle. For me, some people have battles of negativity or you name it. For me, it is learning that I don't have to be constantly pushing myself into the ground. And it is something that I have made so much progress on, but I'm continuing to work on. Mm -hmm. I was in a cycle for several years of pushing too hard in all aspects, over-exercising, under-sleeping, fueling myself in quotes, fueling the sugar and on that sugar roller coaster, negativity in my mind, pressure, self-imposed expectations, all this stuff. And to me, it honestly seemed normal at the time. It just seemed like I was a person who carried a lot of stress around, but it honestly wasn't normal. Even for me, it led to a lot of long lasting health implications. And so I bring this up as a, as a um, caution to anyone who's interested in pursuing a career in this industry, we are givers. We care about people, and it's so easy to drive ourselves into the ground, but I want to share a little bit about what doing that did to me uh, to help people not do that. I had adrenal fatigue, um, which for those of you who haven't yet gone to Hawthorne, basically means that I required so much cortisol, the stress hormone, that it burned out. It, it gave up and burned out, and so my cortisol was very low. I had hormone imbalance. At one point, when I was in my late 20s, a doctor told me my hormones were lower than the postmenopausal women that she worked with, um, and I even lost my period for five years. I was on under chronic stress, just feeling constantly behind and not good enough. And then this one even still makes me shudder a little bit. I had one diagnosis of a mild form of PTSD because there's a period of two years that I almost literally do not remember. So 
my voice changes because these things are really serious. I do not take them lightly. And I do not take the fact that I disrespected my body uh, lightly. It, that is very serious. I'm lucky that even though it's hard for me, I've learned to, and, and I'm still learning, let's be honest, to prioritize self-care. And over the past many years, I'm feeling much, 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 much better. And I want to help share this message with other people. Thank you. Beautiful. I, I, I'm curious, looking at the photograph on this slide, how old it is? Um, it is, I would say, several years old. I, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. Because it's in stark contrast to how you look right now and the other pictures on your slides here. So it really is representative of the stress that you're under and the impact that it was having. You know, the stress shows on your face. It doesn't show on your body. You look all strong and healthy and somebody <laughs> would look at you and say, oh, you know, everything is good. But on the inside, you were collapsing. Yeah, and, and that's really right. I'm glad you raised that, that I, thankfully, I guess, I don't really know if this is thankfully, from the outside was never a person that you would look at and, and say, oh, she's really unhealthy. It was all from the inside. You're exactly right. Right, driven that way. Well, it's so important to take care of ourselves as healthcare practitioners, or any of us. Yeah. so that we can take care of others, whether that's our family or our clients, right? So can you talk a little bit more about how you're implementing this? Sure. Uh, my morning routine, I think, is my favorite and the most impactful way that I take care of myself. Um, for me, the morning routine is a way to center myself. I do not check my email or check the news or anything before I do my morning routine. It's just me, I, it's cozy, it's calm, it's comforting, and it's really a great way to get grounded and, and symbolize to myself that I am the most important and I can't pour into others until I've taken care of myself. So I really like doing that in the morning. Um, even though right now uh, travel is not a reality, I know it will come back and, and vacations are a really important part for uh, me to ground myself, connect with my husband or whoever I'm traveling with and relax a little bit. Um, massages, I honestly used to feel so guilty about getting massages. I love it, it's very restorative for my body and, and my soul. But once I realized that A, I can work this into my budget, it's a line item in my budget and it's not causing me undue financial stress, and B, that it's okay to get a massage or to take a bath or whatever that means to you once a month or however often it works for you, it is absolutely okay. So massages are a big part for me. Exercise still uh, is very important to me. I love exercise in a way, whatever way feels good to my body on that day. Walks, even right now during our state of chaos, just going for a walk and feeling that sunshine on your face trying to leave your technology at home, this is huge for me. If I'm trying to write something or I have some writer's block or I'm stressed about something, any of those things, I'll just get out. Even if it's a five or 10 minute walk, it always makes me feel better. Uh, and then really prioritizing sleep. This used to be my worst health habit because I frankly could get by on a low number of hours of sleep but I realized I was not thriving, I was just surviving, so I am much better and, and very dedicated to prioritizing sleep right now. Beautiful, you know, get by is a, is a key piece there. I, I could get yeah. by, right? I read mm -hmm. a quote this morning, oh, it was about self-care, self-love, and without it, when we're prioritizing others first, we don't really give them our best, we give them what's left of us. Yes, exactly, I love that. So morning routine, yeah. <laughs> morning routines sound like they're very, very important to you. It yeah. seems like everybody has a different version of a morning routine these days, or at least it's helpful for those that I talk to that do. And talk a little bit more about yours. Yes, so I love my morning routine, you're right. And I created the Pepper Planner to help me primarily with my morning routine and then be able to share my routine with others. But I really believe that everyone can customize it to what feels good for them. For me, the, uh, the things that I practice are gratitude, just simply jotting three things for which I'm grateful every morning. And sometimes it's really simple, like um, this cool glass of water or 
my dog is snuggling in a cute way on my lap or whatever. And sometimes it's deeper, more meaningful things, but whatever it is, three things I'm grateful for. Drinking water, so important, but I make sure to prioritize water. Uh, affirmations, I say a set of affirmations to myself to remind myself of my goals and how I wanna show up in the world. Knowledge, this is where my reading comes in. I read for at least 10 minutes every morning. Exercise, unwind is meditation for me. It can be prayer, breathing, anything like that. And then positivity, I listen to some positive music and read a positive quote. And the gratitude is um, a standalone, but you'll notice the other ones spell wake up, W-A-K-E-U-P. Uh, and so that just helps me remember which uh, habits I'm, I'm going to do and prioritize for that day. Great acronym. Love it. I'm using it. We do. <laughs> it sounds so positive, Megan. Um, I also know that you maintain really a positive approach to how you offer and sell your services. So it'd be, I think, really helpful to hear more about that. Sure. Uh, for me, the term desire to serve is really important. I believe in operating out of a desire to serve, and then the profits will come. And of course, we're, well, at least I am in business in part to make money. We all deserve to be paid for the value that we bring, so I'm not denying the importance of that. But I find that when I and also the people I coach do programs or initiatives or whatever, just because we think they're gonna make a lot of money, they almost always fail. So I like to remind myself, if I operate from a desire to serve first, then the profits will come, then the followers, then the whatever you're after will come after that. Some examples right now, um, the reset that I mentioned, the 10-day reset was already on the calendar. We set our yearly calendar in December. It was on the calendar for April 13th. And I thought, around a couple weeks ago, ooh, I don't know if this feels right to promote a program when people might be just worried about getting any food on the table, they might be worried about money, things like that. It just felt a little off. So right. I shifted the program to one, be pay what you can. So many people are in it for free. Some people generously even pay double for other people. Some people paid half, it's whatever that they felt they could pay. And then I shifted it to be much more focused on positivity and self-care and not any specific um, food eliminations, things like that, but encouraging them to fuel their body with as many nutrients as they could. So it's a little shift. Um, mm -hmm. And that's an example of desire to serve. I want to do what's right for people. And I know that all that stuff will come back to me. Yeah. And not, not just go by the script. You know, yes, just exactly. adapted right there. Mm -hmm. Adapted, yes. Same same thing with um, speaking. I had booked a lot of conferences, unfortunately, that aren't going to happen or are going to be postponed. So really quickly, within a day, I developed a virtual wellness class to offer to these companies, which helps their employees through immune boosters and productivity working at home and how to manage the emotions of all of this. So um, that's been really, really fun to deliver to hospitals and corporations and all kinds of places. So again, it's that desire to serve, that ability to pivot and knowing that um, you will be paid for your value, that just can't be the driving factor. So we do deserve to be paid for our value. Just like I said, don't do programs just because of the money. It's really about um, doing what you think offers the value to most people. Sometimes I do program, like I do free coaching Friday, every Friday I answer people's questions on Facebook and Instagram live. And that's obviously free. I don't, in quotes, get anything out of it. But what I do get is the opportunity to help people. And a lot of those people in the future turn into clients. So it is a cycle that um, pays off for everyone. I really, conclude this part by just thinking about being business savvy versus money hungry. We have to have business sense, but our driving force cannot be just money. I agree, yeah. Hmm. Believing in yourself, Megan, it sounds like there's a lot of that, you know, believing in um, that you have what you need, um, you have what others need. And, 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 and you show up to, to be of service. So have you ever imagined that you'd be helping so many people in so many different ways? Well, the answer is kind of yes and no, but 
as funny as this sounds to say, the overwhelming answer is yes. And I am not an arrogant person, but I believed when I started this business that I had the potential to impact so many people. I believe so much in my ability to serve others and I believe in my knowledge and I be believe in my ability to persevere and I believe in my genuine spirit of wanting to serve and I know that goes so far. I always know also that whatever obstacles I'll, I run into, I will find a way, even if one's not immediately obvious. And if you know all of those things, anyone who is listening, who's thinking about starting a business, you have those things you will be successful. Remember, success isn't a smooth path from one point to you know infinite success or whatever. It's a winding road. If you just believe that you can serve and that you your heart's in the right place and you will overcome obstacles, you can believe in yourself as well. I think there's a, a big difference between having doubts about a specific thing. I might doubt a program or I might doubt if this picture looks good or whatever, those doubts are fine, but a deep lack of self-belief, that needs to be overcome and can be overcome by uh, consciously uh, writing affirmations, saying affirmations, believing in yourself, focusing on the positive, all of that. It's a lot of self-work, uh, but I realize that a lot of entrepreneurs that I coach are held back by that self-belief. So I think this is even more important to tackle than any specific spreadsheet or business tool or whatever. It's the self-belief that is really important. Um, so again, one of those main ways that I overcome it is these affirmations. I say affirmations to myself daily, and at first it sounded really cheesy to me and I was rolling my eyes and all of this, but it really helps me tap into that feeling of self-belief and start my day feeling empowered and believing in it helps to have an affirmation that you at least want to believe in. Right? Yes. Right. The, years ago, I heard it's like, oh, yeah, affirmations are what we say to ourselves. They're just lies that we say to ourselves until they become true. And mm -hmm. it's so such a different way of framing it to say, this is what I want to believe. This is what I want to achieve. And yeah. by repeating it and reminding ourselves of it throughout the day, it's a very powerful action. So I believe in yeah. affirmations, too. Yeah. Well, you know, you're such, you have expressed such positivity here. Um, you always feel so positive. I, I, I have a sense that that's what attracts people to you. Do you hear that from others? Well, thank you. I do. Um, I always believe there's a bright side to everything. I was born a pessimist and a worry. This makes me laugh, but it's really true. I was a very worry wart little kid. Um, but I realized that living that way didn't make me happy. I realized the benefits of staying positive uh, as much as possible and, and always looking at the bright side. So I surround myself with positivity. There are quotes and coasters and posters and books and all kinds of stuff all around me uh, to remind me of the positive. I surround myself with positive people. I surround my brain with positive thoughts and I really work to attract that positivity for myself and then be able to reflect that out into other people's lives as well. I believe that what you give out, you attract back. And I know I want to be surrounded by that. So I try to give that out as much as possible. What a beautiful share um, that you've done here today, Megan. I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking about all that you've achieved, but the ways that you've set out and the mindset that you've had and and really developed so your personal um your personal tools within yourself have just made a marked influence on the way that you conduct yourself in business and the way that you have here today beautiful shares really inspiring and motivating thank you so much i want to make sure that people know how to get in touch in touch with you and stay in contact Yes, absolutely. I would love to chat with anyone who's listening live or after the fact. Happy to answer questions or do what I can to help out. I have my website on here, and that will also lead, lead you to my email address. It's thelionshare.org. Uh, my Instagram at thelionshare. I'm most active on Instagram and always posting lots of stuff there. And then also on Facebook, the Lion Share Wellness. I would love to be in contact with you. 
Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. There's um, some great positive comments coming in from our attendees, and I'll share those with you later. But the one question that I had earlier is what podcast do you like? Can you name just a couple that you're that stand out for you? <laughs> Um, I really like The Genius Life by Max Lugavere. That is a nice balance of uh, nutrition and kind of overall wellness. I like Sean Stevenson's podcast for nutrition. Uh, the Broken Brain by Drew Pruitt, Pruitt that I believe is a great one. Um, I like The Rise podcast by Rachel Hollis. For more business, I like Online Marketing Made Easy by Amy Porterfield. Um, I like, let's think of uh, another, oh, Pat Flynn's um, Smart Passive Income is good for business as well. I mean, my, my podcast list goes on and on and on, but those might be a few of my favorites. Thank you. I look forward to the list, and well, you can, when I get the list, I can tag it with this um, right. recording, too, so that people have it. Sure. So just I'll, I'll leave. It's one of the comments. Excellent okay. motivating talk. I'm definitely a fan of yours. <laughs> oh, thank you. Right? Nice, nice. <laughs> it's really been a pleasure, Megan. I hope you'll visit us again at Hawthorne and continue to share the good works that you're doing and, and such positivity in all the ways that you do. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate all that you've done for me and, and everyone at Hawthorne as well. And thank you for having me today. Absolutely. All right, everybody, I want you to know and help us spread the word that our next All About Alumni will meet back here again on Wednesday, May 6th at noon Pacific time when we get to listen to Nishanga Bliss. Nishanga is a graduate from our unique doctoral and science program here. It's a combined doctorate and clinical training program as well. And just a reminder that we've had so many fantastic authors and graduate presentations here at the All About Alumni. So hope you'll visit our and explore our archived webinars on our website and view their presentations too. And until then, I want to wish you all the best of health. I encourage you to take good care, especially during this time. It matters that we're practicing our physical distancing while staying socially connected, just like we did here today. So thank you all for joining. Thank you again, Megan. Take good thank care, you. everybody.